Hello there, my fellow green space communists, and welcome to another episode of Battletech Lore. Today will mark the beginning, hopefully a successful one too, of a new series in my overall Battletech coverage. Those of you who've been watching my videos for a few years now might remember that among my first Battletech videos, I made one episode overviews of each of the major inner sphere powers. And unfortunately, that's all I did back then. But I never stopped wanting to go into more depth on the Great Houses. Hopefully today I can change that, by starting a series on the militaries of each faction. These are actually very lore-rich topics, and I hope you're gonna enjoy it as much as I do. And, surprise twist, it's not the Federated Sons or the Draconis Combine who have arguably the most famous militaries, but maybe the weakest of the bunch. Of course, in this universe, weak doesn't mean that much when you still control a sizable chunk of the Inner Sphere. Ladies and gentlemen, the Capellan Confederation Armed Forces. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The Capellan Confederation Armed Forces, or CCAF for short, which I'm gonna use a lot in this video, is, as you might imagine, the entire military of the Capellans. It evolved originally from the Capellan Defense Force, created in the beginning by Capellan Chancellor Franco Liao. They are a professional and competent fighting force, but unfortunately, throughout most of their history, they were on the defensive, forced to fight against almost impossible odds while also being hamstrung by their own government. Besides the regular and the militia forces, they also possess the warrior houses, semi-religious military orders, and also the death commandos, the special forces group of this faction. These exist entirely separate from the CCAF and answer directly to the Chancellor, to whom they swear personal loyalty. Before we get into the nitty gritty though, I figured most of you would have liked to see the ranks of the faction. Thus, from the lowest to the highest, we have The Recruit, or Xia Ben Bing, marked by a simple green bar The Lance Corporal, or San Ben Bing, marked by a green bar with two brass stripes cutting along the corners The Lance Sergeant, or Si Ben Bing, marked by a brass bar with one green diagonal stripe in the center The Force Leader, or Yi Shi Ben Bing marked by a brass bar with two diagonal green stripes, the sub-commander, or Sao Wei, marked by a brass bar, the commander, or Sang Wei, marked by a brass bar with one silver pip, the captain, or Sao Shao, marked by a brass bar with two silver pips, the major, or Zong Zhao, marked by a brass bar with three silver pips, the colonel, or Sang Shao, marked by a silver triangle with an open center, the senior colonel, or Zhang Jun, marked by a brass triangle with open center, the senior general, or Sang Zhang Jun, marked by a brass triangle with green center, and at the top of it all, of course, the chancellor. Ostensibly, the high command of the CCAF, or Strategios, is responsible for all strategic operational planning, both offensive and defensive, and also the general day-to-day -day running of the military. Its membership includes the Chancellor in their capacity as Commander-in-Chief, representatives of the Capellan government, six senior colonels, and a strategic military director. In reality, just how well the Strategios operates in their capacity depends entirely on the goodwill of the Chancellor. Many times in Capellan history, the Chancellor and other civilian officials have sidelined the Command Council and taken a personal role in running the military, micromanaging even the tiniest units, with foreseeable bad results. When allowed to do their job with minimal oversight from the Chancellor though, the military as a whole operates in a streamlined, efficient manner. When the Chancellor is absent, the Strategic Military Director serves as the commander of the CCAF, and also the regent of the capital world of Cyan, and he has full authority over the Ministry of the Military. When the Chancellor is there, the SMD serves as their chief military advisor. 
given the power of that position, trust between the Chancellor and the SMD is very important, as is steadfast loyalty. After the betrayal of Pavel Ridzik during the Fourth Succession War, it was official policy for the SMD to relinquish in perpetuity all titles and land holdings. Additionally, the Chancellor does retain personal control over the warrior houses and the Def Commandos, both as a check on the Director's power and to carry out special jobs which don't have the military support. After Jasmine Liao abolished the rank of Colonel, the responsibilities of that title were given over to a new rank, known as Senior Colonel. There were six Senior Colonels, one for each of the founding commonalities of the Confederation. Each Colonel was responsible for all military planning, logistics, and unit readiness in their assigned commonality. On the Command Council, the Senior Colonels answered to the Strategic Military Director. After Chancellor San Tzu Liao came to power, he reinstated the rank of General or Jiang Jun. In place of the six senior colonels, we now had ten Jiang Jun, two for each of the five existing commonalities. The commander of the CCAF Navy is also part of that group, considered to be the equivalent of a Jiang Jun. One is given responsibility for all line regiments assigned to their commonality, the other with all the Home Guard and planetary militia. Now, as one might imagine in a futuristic setting where war is perpetual, and it's not 40k, it is the Ministry of the Military that is one of the most important bureaus in the entire ministerial, responsible for all aspects of supporting the armed forces. When they are not being messed with by the Chancellor and other officials, it typically operates in a highly efficient manner. This is composed of six departments, with each head answering to the Minister of the Military and the Strategios. After the ascension of San Liao, the department heads in the ministry were all given the rank of Jiang Jun, making them equal in authority to those in the Strategios, both to force better cooperation and provide a break on any officer getting too ambitious. The six departments of the ministry are as follows. Administration and Finance these are responsible for all record-keeping and payroll function, including disability and death benefits, as well as maintaining the promotion lists. Unfortunately, corruption and graft are widespread in this department, requiring a permanent team of the Maskirovka on the lookout for illegal activity. Maskirovka is pretty much the secret police of the Capellans. The Acquisitions and Training Department They are responsible for the recruitment and training of all new soldiers. The Capellan Medical Corps. They are responsible, as you might imagine, for health and medical care of all soldiers in the CCAF. It provides medics and corpsmen to line and home guard regiments, and maintains standing emergency medical battalions with their own transports, surgical and intense care facilities. The Capellan Confederation Navy. They are responsible for the transportation of ground forces and their protection while in transit. It includes all jump ships, warships, and dropships. Aerospace fighters which are not integrated as part of a regiment or grouped together as aerospace regiments also fall under this department. The Procurement Division They are responsible for all logistical concerns, including purchasing, transportation, and storing all equipment and munitions. Finally, Research and Development these are responsible for conducting all scientific research into martial technology and testing out new equipment for quality control. They frequently partner with civilian tech firms, and some of their successes included the Raven, the Cataphract, and the Shan Yu Battlemax. Moving on from the departments, we arrive at the organization of the CCAF. Once again, there are several divisions existing in the organization. The first are the Line Regiments regular units who are generally receiving the best training and the best equipment. Among these units, there is a further division between frontline forces and reserves. The former, including famous units like the Capellan Hussars, spearhead assaults and garrison critical planets in the Confederation. The reserves take on a more defensive role and tend to be staffed with greener recruits, but are no less potent a fighting force when led properly. The Home Guard regiments serve as a national militia, 
operating within their assigned commonality and defending worlds under attack, hindering the enemy's advance until reinforcements can arrive. Each of these is composed of three battalions plus support units, typically using combat vehicles, although the use of battle mechs became prevalent in the 31st century. They are usually garrisoned on major planets, but can quickly relocate to an endangered planet within their area of operation. Each planet also maintains their own militia, drawn from the local population and used entirely for defense. The size and equipment of a planet's militia can depend very much on how wealthy it is, and how much its nobility is willing to spend on defending it. At one end of a poor planet, it will have just a single understrength regiment of two battalions, foot infantry equipped with small arms and heavy support weapons. At the other end of the spectrum, a prosperous and important world will have dozens of militia regiments, some even equipped with battle mechs. Historically, these militia units were separate from the CCAF command structure, but as part of the Jinsheng reforms, they have since become integrated under the Home Guard. Finally, the CCF does make use of a lot of mercenaries, categorizing them in one of two ways. Chartered mercenaries pledge to serve House Liao for a specific length of time, and they are under direct military control in exchange for better pay and special access to stores. Unchartered mercenaries sign with a local government, and while they don't receive the same state support, they do have greater freedom on how to do their job. Notably loyal mercenary units, like McCarran's Armored Cavalry, have been rewarded for their continued service with the state by being turned into full units of the CCIF and given citizenship in the Confederation. By 2750, the CCIF supposedly had a strength of 42 battle mech regiments and 30 warships. By 2765, they expanded tremendously with 92 battle mech regiments and a naval fleet of 37 vessels. At the start of the succession wars, they had nearly doubled, with almost 192 frontline mech regiments. That number would drastically decrease down to only 45 regiments by the end of the Third Succession War. At the end of the Fourth War, and after Hans Davian finished spanking them, they could muster only 30 regiments. By 3062, the CCAF did manage to rebuild some of its lost power, and could muster 45 mech regiments. The CCAF has practiced combined arms warfare throughout its existence, to varying degrees and results, with the battle mech, unsurprisingly, taking a preeminent place on the battlefield. Traditionally, each mech regiment will include an independent command company and be assigned many supporting units, which answer to the regiment's commanding officer. On average, this will include two flights of aerospace fighters, at least one battalion of armor, and between one company to a full regiment of infantry. Unfortunately, the armed forces have historically suffered from a lack of initiative, especially during times when to show initiative might have been interpreted as being anti-government. They also suffered from a need of commanders to prove their political reliability with success on a battlefield. Many officers would defer to their superior, who themselves would be reluctant to utilize the proper forces in a battle whose outcome was uncertain, out of fear for their lives. Indeed, during the later part of the succession wars, many officers became paralyzed when cut off from central command, leaving it to the mercenaries to take charge. Others, when faced with a situation where even victory could lead to a court-martial and even execution, suffered from what became known as hopeless battle syndrome. Better to die right now in a heroic last stand than live with the uncertainty of suffering a worse fate. Although the Xin Sheng movement did much to reverse this trend, the CCAF officers continue to be monitored for signs of the syndrome. Prior to the succession wars, the CCAF adopted the buffer zone defense policy of the old Taikonov Union, occupying all border planets in depth in order to defend its member states and relied heavily on large concentrations of artillery on the defensive. Unfortunately, the losses suffered in the first succession wars made this policy untenable, and, especially during the second succession war, highly trained Davian units with superior mobility proved capable of outmaneuvering and destroying these specialist artillery formations. 
By the start of the Third Succession War, artillery units were instead being doled out in penny packets to support individual formations, and Chancellor Otto Liao had adopted a controversial elastic defense, relying on mobile strategic reserves to respond to an incursion, rather than trying to hold the enemy at the border. Arguably, this change in strategy helped save the Confederation, but at a huge cost to the armed forces. During the reign of Tormax Liao, not a single frontline regiment was more than 70% of its official strength. Because of the changes made by Chancellor San Tzu Liao and his son, Daoshan Liao, the CCAF nowadays is not what it used to be. Ever since the CCAF has continued to use their augmented regiment structures since 3081, every regiment is now a flexible combined arms unit. The doctrine had been owned to a fine edge by decades of low-intensity warfare. The average capellan has been seasoned by regular combat deployments, which are separated by rotations to comfortable garrison worlds, resulting in men and women who are both experienced and well-motivated. For many reasons throughout their history, House Liao relied mostly on medium and light mechs, which could perform multiple rows, putting it at a disadvantage against units using heavier or specialist battle mechs. During the latter part of the succession wars, as the number of mechs and resources dwindled, it became standing orders for mech units to be withdrawn from losing battles, often at the expense of more conventional units. After San Tzu Liao came to power, the military began to address some of these deficiencies and expanded their inventory, including an increased use in mechs from the Free Worlds League and the Word of Blake. The Capellan Air Defense Force had relied on older fighter craft like the Eagle and the Thunderbird during the early succession wars. Although by the Third Succession War, these outdated models were proven to be just that, outdated. Thereafter, they were relegated to the interior defense in favor of newer, native designs, like the Transit and the Transgressor. Armor units, too, favored Capellan-built vehicles, including the Po, the Zhukov, and the Regulator. But nevertheless, they are not above seeking the foreign-built models like the Blizzard. Indeed, throughout their history, the Capellan Armored Corps was arguably the best trained and best equipped of any conventional inner sphere force. Ironically, because often they were expected to fight actual battle mechs. More recently, the Capellan Confederation had undergone a massive arms buildup under Daoshan. Their secret stockpiles of battle mechs and continued war production far outstripped the assessments done by foreign intelligence agencies. House Liao secretly mass produced weapons of war at a pre jihad rate and funneled vehicles, ammunition, and spare parts to dummy militia units and hidden depots. They also continued being major customers of the arms merchants of the clan Sea Fox and the Free Worlds League. They might even end up being the best equipped combat force in the Inner Sphere someday, outside of the clans of course. Finally for today, a few of the main military colleges of the Capellan Confederation. These include the Capella War College, the Liao Conservatory of Military Arts, the Sarna Martial Academy, the Cyan Center for Martial Disciplines, Cyan University, the St. Ives Academy of Martial Sciences, and the Victoria Academy of Arms and Technology. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to narrate to you for today regarding the military of the Capellan Confederation. Might sound like a paper tiger compared to the bigger successor states, at least territory-wise, but they are not without their bite. Also, in case you're wondering, I will try to eventually get to the likes of the Death Commandos and the Warrior Houses in their own unique videos. Provided, of course, that you folks want me to. For now, my goal is to make at least one of these considerably longer video overviews for each of the major powers, and then see into what details we can get afterwards. As always, I more than welcome your thoughts on the Capellan military in the comments. If you found this informative or entertaining, do leave a like, share, subscribe, and click the bell icon to stay updated. Thanks a lot for watching, and have a healthy and awesome day. This is GDN signing out.